most investors don't have access to really big upsides. Look at Airbnb, right? Look at the, the seed first, second round. It was all VC, except for one individual, Ashton Kutcher. That's mm -hmm. it. Ordinary investors, wait, back of the line. Let's get ready to scale. Hey guys, thanks for joining me for yet another episode of Ready to Scale. I'm your host, Jeanette Friedrich, Director of Investor Relations at Blue Lake Capital. Joining me today is Riggs Eckleberry, and we are going to be talking about if water is the new gold. So Riggs is the president and CEO of Origin Clear, a publicly traded water technology company that provides treatment solutions and financing, which makes it very interesting for commercial, industrial, and municipal clients. Previously, he was the president and COO of Cyber Defender Corporation, and prior to that, the principal of Tech Transform. He's also served in a variety of other leadership positions with other technology-based companies. He's joining us from Clearwater, Florida today. And the fun fact, interesting fact that I got to dig up on him is that he actually has a master's of commercial ongoing vessels, which I don't even really know what that means. I'm guessing it involves boats. And essentially, this is where he got um, his first experience and really his education uh, when it came to institutional PR, organizational management, and it actually started off in the nonprofit sector. So, Riggs, welcome to the show. And what is that about? Well, thank you, first of all, for having me on. And um, yes, early on, I um, had the privilege of working with one of the 20th century's um, most known philosophers, L. Ron Hubbard, and I worked directly with him to help him with, um, we were on a ship, his his ship, uh, the ship that he was based upon, um, and that the really uh, mobility was important because um, he was getting a lot of um, PR attacks and really um, had, we had to figure out how to exist um, without, uh, in other words, to make strong enough friends ashore that we wouldn't be affected by the wider propaganda, whatever was going on. And so that was really the training that I had, which was how do you treat um, a topic with entire, you know, complete truth? He insisted on, this is one of the most important things about PR he insisted upon, which is, you know, always operate with the truth, never operate with lies. That was number one. And, um, Another one he said is never create a, a PR problem where there is none. So you could easily create one and, and you got to watch out for that. But, you know, operate with the truth, but but also operate within the acceptance level of people ashore who they primarily just want to you know, sell you some produce or whatever it is. They have, they, they, and so how do you relate to people in a way that is real to them? And and so I learned so much about PR from him. Um, and and as part of that, because we were on a ship, I um, gained, um, eventually I became a master of ocean-going vessels, as you said, um, and spent time um, not working with him, but, you know, in the South Pacific, you know, on, on uh, general cargo steamers, otherwise known as tramp steamers, and uh, sailing around the South Pacific and having crazy adventures. And from that, I learned really, that um, you know, you have got to deal with the problem in front of you in a way that um, essentially saves your bacon. You've got to do that, no matter what. You've got to do that, and it served me well in the years since then. Um, in 1978, this all happened in the 70s. Mm -hmm. This um, 1978, I said, you know, this is great, but being on a ship crossing the ocean with a, a load of dried coconut is a very slow life. And so I decided, okay, I got I to gotta go back to the U.S. and get into the swing of things. And that's when I encountered the tech space in New York City. I started a, computer, a company that was um, putting the first um, businesses onto uh, mini computers from these, you know, bear down hard safeguard ledger, you know, like got to push hard to get through the, the copies kind of thing. And... Um, and that was my business and also major learning experience. Fast forward to the 90s, I was, so this is the 80s in New York. Mm -hmm. 90s was the dot-com, which I fell in love with. I had a 
wonderful time. And it culminated, as you said, with a role as the number two at Cyber Defender, taking it onto the NASDAQ. Between 1995 and 2005, I basically became, I, I did the corporate ladder because up till then I'd been, you know, nonprofit, uh, ships, working in film, various things, but I'd not, had never been corporate. And you can't, I don't think, uh, first of all, I'd rather be an entrepreneur, but if you want real capital, you've got to go corporate. And mm -hmm. so um, I had to bite the bullet and do it because you cannot survive in the corporate world without having spent serious time in it, as you know. Yeah. So, um, so in 1995, I started. And then by 2005, I was a, a number two in a company going to the NASDAQ. And at that point, I did the foolish thing of asking a fund if they needed a CEO. <laughs> Big mistake. Um, ask what, you know, you, you want to watch out what you, what you wish for, because they said, yes. And all of a sudden I was a CEO of a company that was in this crazy space called algae for biofuels, <laughs> which is one of those huh, kind of spaces. Um, but at the time with the crude oil in 2007 at $120 a barrel, mm -hmm. it worked. That would be today like 160. It's, it was ridiculously high. It was being kept high by design to encourage renewables. But along came fracking and goodbye high price. And at that point, we realized that we were not going to do algae anytime soon. Um, I still think it's a wonderful thing. But what we did is we reinvented the business into a space that really, really needed our help, which mm -hmm. is the water treatment, what wastewater treatment which is in deep trouble um, and is very neglected and also is very hard to change. A lot of complacency, a lot of, a lot of um, you know, like we are the big water people and we don't change a lot kind of thing. And so I really devoted my life um, in the 16 year overnight success that we've had uh, to transforming the water industry. And we believe we finally found the point, uh, the fulcrum where we can move the needle and make change happen. Yeah, very interesting. And I definitely want to get into talking about what Origin Clear is doing, um, you know, the service and solutions that you're providing, what your business model looks like. But before we get into that, you know, you 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 say it nonchalantly, but it's a huge deal to go public. And so, you know, I'm curious to know um, what was your journey, you know, as far as going public? Did you start with the intention of taking it public? Did you kind of find yourself working you know, uh, towards that with intent, or is this something that just kind of, you know, it, you kind of grew into that position? I mean, I just would love to know, you know, kind of how you went about making that happen. That's a really good question. The fund that I, they, um, that I already knew and that I, who knew me well uh, from certain assignments I'd taken on on behalf of their companies, they specialize in uh, going public right away and raising money in the public sector, which means. That you're that you you're screwed for for VC. That once you do that, I remember going to San Francisco soon after starting the, this company, and meeting with a bunch of VCs, and they were being so humiliated because they're like, "What are you doing here? <laughs> you, 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 like you you blew it. You went public. How can we help? Because they do the rounds A through G. You know the whole routine. Um, and uh, basically, what you do is you go public as a as a small cap. Uh, micro cap really. Yeah. And then you raise money from uh, retail investors. Now that's, there's a couple, this, the good part is I like is that uh, I'm not, you know, I don't have to take that monthly call with the, the VC partner who then arbitrarily decides to have you do, you know, let's start planting geraniums. I mean, just out of the blue, whatever <laughs> VC partner thinks is right. Um, so you're not subject to that arbitrary business. And I've seen it happen. I've had clients who were, who had to live through that, and it's very tough. So my, who had to report to? I report to the people we serve, the the end users, right? And that that's how it should be. Um, but the downside of being a microcap is that you can raise money, but it's not big capital; it's trickle money. Mm -hmm. And um, and the, and also on top of it, the whole over the counter space became, uh, excuse me, became trashed by a lot of abuses a lot of what we call bad actors mm -hmm. and the SEC came down hard on it. And, you know, you're, you're solving it for a few criminals, but you end up limiting it for everybody. 
mm. kind of how it works. So yeah. um, we knew that we had to go to the NASDAQ. That's the only way we, we could go. And at that point, we had to think through how to do it. Um, the first thing you want to do when you go to the NASDAQ, of course, is you got to qualify. <laughs> so you have to have revenues. You have to, but also it's very, very important, I think, that you be differentiated. Like, how are you special? And, um, you know, um, I was just seeing a clip of a very, very good book called The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing by Al Race. And, um, and he's, in that, that he says, be first in the category. And if you can't be first in the category, invent a category in which to be first. <laughs> Interesting. So that I, you know, I took to heart from day one. Um, and so I would say that it's relatively easy to go public, uh, but the, the means have changed. It's times have changed. And frankly, the best way that I know is to use crowdfunding, you know, uh, what's called regulation a, which allows anybody to invest. And some very large companies have been built using crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Um, you know, here at Blue Lake, uh, the way that we, you know, have been able to build out our portfolio is, is through a syndication model, which essentially is basically like crowdfunding, you know, wrapped in a different, you know, title to a certain extent, a little, a little bit different in the structure, but, um, you know, it, and as simple and as silly as this sounds, I'm very curious to know, how did you get people to buy your stock? <laughs> well, it's, well, it's high concept, right? You've got to have something that, um, people see, look, most investors don't have access to really big upsides. Look at Airbnb, right? Look at the the seed first, second round. It was all VC, except for one individual, Ashton Kutcher. That's mm -hmm. it. Ordinary investors, way to the back of, back, back of the line. So ordinary investors are looking at this, you know, 8% uh, gains per year, whatever it is. And that's, that doesn't even hit, you know, uh, true if you combine inflation with with depreciation of the of the currency, you're breaking even around 10, 12 percent, and you need to, in my opinion, you need to do far better than that to really break through. At least part of your portfolio has got to be in something that can really outperform mm -hmm. everything else. You know, um, I'm not saying put all your money into something crazy, but take a chunk of your um, available uh, in, in investment portfolio, IRA, for example, and Put it towards something that has a potential to multiply nicely, and um, and investors are looking for that now. For a long time, it was about the stock only, but then we created something that was, in fact, kind of a fund, um, a lot like I don't know if you know Master Limited Partnerships in Energy. Hmm. Very, but we created something like that for water. Interesting. So, no, I'm not familiar with that. Can you explain how that works? Okay, so um, in 1981, Apache Energy created uh, Master Limited Partnerships. Today, it's a $300 billion sector. Um, with um, And what it is, is the the funds package energy properties, pipelines, um, gas, oil, into a basket, and then the investors get royalties. And in the case of energy, they get substantial tax benefits. Okay, but we took the same structure uh, we didn't have access to the tax benefits, so we we put a bunch of equity in place. So similar thing, basket of water properties, people invest, they get royalties, uh, profit share, and they get um, equity in the business itself. And so um, it's 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 extremely attractive from a you know regular uh, generational earnings point of view with these profit shares. But then also the, the the potential for growth. You see, it's all very well to market a penny stock and like woohoo, it's good, you know, we're right. a penny, we could go to a dollar. Think of, you know, that's a hundred X. Oh my God, right? Yeah. But it's all concept. Now, if you have actual assets backing an investment, so that the investor can actually put a lien on the properties to enforce enforce his royalties, that's a different kind of investment. And it it's more uh, appropriate, for example, to investors like yours who are accustomed to hard asset uh, investment like in multifamily and so forth. You've got something tangible, right? Now, mm -hmm. um, I would argue that multifamily right now is going through a lot of dis disruption due to interest rates. It is it is what it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's one of the problems with the real estate space is it's incredibly interest. It's super leveraged, right? 
and yeah. uh, and so and all commodities today, all mature commodities, are subject to disruptions. For example, I look at gold. Mm -hmm. Well, gold's doing well, but it should be far better. I mean, come on. And um, and then you know, Bitcoin's up, Bitcoin's down, Bitcoin's up, whatever. Um, oil. I was I was in oil, and it's like I was like, okay, there's war in the Middle East. Surely it's going to go somewhere. Nope, went nowhere. So the mature um, assets are either incredibly dependent upon factors that are out of their control, like interest rates, or they're subject to other uh, manipulation, whereas water is early. Now, what do we mean by water? <laughs> yeah, last time, exactly. water <laughs> has been a monopoly. It's been kind of like AT&T was back in the day, which is municipalities either issuing bonds, so you can invest in bonds, or you could invest in the very large water companies servicing them, mm -hmm. and that's it, at, or an ETF. What's happening now is that monopoly is breaking up and uh, increasingly um, industrial users, remember indus industry and agriculture represent 90% of all water demand. So when they, uh, what they're doing is they're moving off the grid, no longer setting their dirty water to the utility. Now, why would they do that? Well, number one, inflation is running super high in water. Uh, water rates and sewage rates are inflating faster than healthcare or college tuition, which is already inflating super high. Mm -hmm. So they want to get off the inflation bandwagon. Number two, and that's because the utilities themselves are underfunded, so they're they're using the rates as they got to do something. Number two, when you do your own water treatment, you can recycle the, the water. You can use it again. It lowers the cost of the incoming water. Mm -hmm. And number three you are not subject to the whims of the municipal utility. You're, as long as you meet permit requirements, you're on your own, you're good. And that is actually one of the attractive facts about um, you know, decentralized water, as we call it. Now, there's a fourth element, which we now have created, which is water as a service, meaning that the, the buyer gets a machine, but it does not belong to the buyer, it belongs to Water, the, the water as a service company and they pay on the meter by the gallon as they're accustomed to. Mm -hmm. But they're not paying the municipality, they're paying a private utility and that A, it takes the capital problem away, all of a sudden, poof, no capital required. And these days, capital cost of capital matters. Oh yeah. Right? So that's a big deal. And um, Secondly, it creates that that um, asset base because remember, the, it, the the all the equipment remains the property of the the, uh, the the private utility that's doing this water as a service thing, and so you end up with a, a fleet of water systems, and now the question is, well, who funds all those water systems? And uh, we're not the only player in water as a service, but mm -hmm. the other players all work with either large funds. PE funds or VC, mm -hmm. we're the only ones that work with everyday retail investors. Interesting. That's that's our that's our claim to fame. It's our superpower because we have spent years figuring out how to make retail investors happy and willing to um, come come back again and again um, to invest because they have a good experience. So we've we've done we've learned that well, and what we did is. Um, it wasn't obvious when I entered the water space that self-treatment was the thing. <laughs> I was like everybody else, like, well, you know, I uh, open the faucet, water comes out, I flush the toilet, water goes away. What's the problem, right? Huh. Um, and uh, what I found that was, was that there were terrible problems with the central infrastructure and that decentralization was happening. But for years, I was... I was uh, waving the banner of like, hey, decentralization, and nobody cared. <laughs> no, like decentralization, and it, you know, literally, they were like, who cares? Mm -hmm. Well, now it's changed. Major corporations are doing their own, like PepsiCo just committed to uh, actually more than 100% uh, reuse of their water because they, they, they use a lot of fruit, so they have more, they, they can go over 100% because they have um, water in the, in the form of agricultural products that, you know, squeezes out. 
So they are completely off the grid for their own processed water. And there's a bunch more. So it's a trend. Interesting. And so I knew this back in 2016. But a voice in a wilderness. Nevertheless, we built two businesses that service that market. And when we and then we in 2020, we came up with the idea of this um, capital free option, creating the 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 uh, water like an oil well, we call it, which is this, uh, and we called it water on demand. And we started raising money for it from retail investors. And we have built up a, um, a, a, a money to invest. And now we're about to go into our first um, commercial showcase. And you'll be interested to, oh, um, what is the fastest, fastest growing real estate sector today, right now? Oh, uh, I if I had to guess, if it, if we're looking at the fastest growing as as in the newest, I think probably the build to run space. Bill Jones, that's a very that's a that's a really good one, and it's also reinforced by startups like Boxable, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, I was just, I was just on a on a Twitter space listening to Grant Cardone. He said, "I'm putting in two point six billion dollars into trailer parks." <laughs> well, yeah, you know, but Cord Grant Cardone likes to say whatever serves Grant Cardone. So, <laughs> of course, but the point I'm making is trailer parks are growing fast because Americans can are going down the affordability ladder. This so uh, trailer parks and RV campgrounds. People are living full time in RV campgrounds now. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say that. I necessarily think that's actually anything new. Um, they've had a really cool little community vibe, you know, well, long, long ago. Um, I, in my opinion, I would say that I think built to rent is probably um, what is most likely to take off for a nation of renters. But to sacrifice from going to a home or an apartment into a trailer, I think that's I think that's a, a very dramatic jump from one type of lifestyle to another. So I don't know that I'd expect it to work out that way, but nonetheless. Uh, well, let's... look at it this way, and I'm not gonna argue with you because of course you are, <laughs> I don't argue with domain experts. <laughs> all, all I wanna say is a tremendous number of millennials cannot buy a house. The median price is $450,000 and, and with mortgage rates, forget about it. But mm -hmm. they can um, move into a mobile home park because they don't have to own the land, right? That's That's rented. They can even rent the, the mobile home, really, but you know, or worst case, they buy it. But that's not that's not four hundred thousand dollars. And the RV campground, same thing. So it's an affordable way to get uh, something that you're, um, but it's like maybe even cheaper than renting, right? So anyway, mm -hmm. it's it's flourishing because people are finding uh, are really uh, there. There's a lot of inflation going on with with the home prices and so forth. Um, but the specific thing that's going on in terms of water is that all the states are busy upgrading the sanitation of these mobile home parks. Mm -hmm. Because that's, you know, that's a dirty secret of uh, mobile home parks is that the sanitation is what's called passive treatment. Ew, which <laughs> that means doesn't sound good. <laughs> it's a lagoon and the stuff goes into a lagoon and it sits. That's oh. passive treatment or septic. Either one of those is no longer acceptable to uh, the Texas Commission of uh, Environmental Quality or the um, EPA and um, the EPA equivalent in Alabama, et cetera. And, um, and so they are requiring upgrades. Mm -hmm. And um, so we installed a system for a trailer park uh, called Neville Home Park. And the owner, this is before we had this new funding system, she had to give up half her equity in the trailer park to pay for the water system that would allow it to keep operating. Wow, interesting. That's not okay. No, no. I mean, it's terrible, but uh, wow. Uh, yeah. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of small, uh, the, the trailer park space, the, le the legacy trailer park space has a lot of small operators. Oh yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It's yeah, it's it's definitely very popular. I've interviewed many a guest that owns you know trailer parks, and they they can definitely be very profitable, and it's a very interesting business model. Um, you know, everything from you know owning obviously uh, the property to renting out you know to the tenants, um, you know, and and you know at times I've heard of some even having uh, the water rights, which is a game changer as well if they happen to have you know a well. Um, so yeah. 
Um, and now, well, so anyway, just think about the problem of a million, come up with a million dollars now. Most trailer park owners would sure. not be able to do that very easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So just to kind of, you know, bring it back to center here. So basically, Origin Clear has designed the technology to treat the wastewater and essentially recycle it. And then in addition to that, you not only can treat the water, but you're also creating somewhat of a financing model as well with your water on demand um, you know, services that you're now offering. So what I'm curious to know is, let's say, you know, a large developer, um, you know, in incorporates this type of system um, when they're building, let's say, for example, multifamily, right? Because it's low hanging fruit for me. So a multifamily property. So it's got its own almost self-sustaining system for water treatments, uh, mm -hmm. other than, you know, the new water that would have to be infused into it. Uh, what do you potentially think this type of infrastructure being put in place could do to uh, property values? Right. Well, there's two factors at work. One, the first one is one that we've encountered, uh, which is that we, as an example, a, a dealership that we equipped in Pennsylvania was able to move into very cheap land that was off sewage. So they they equipped it with a what's called a black water um, a recirculation system so that they were treating their own black uh, black water is a euphemism for you know what right so um the they didn't have to have a sewage connection and they were able to buy really really cheap land in pennsylvania number one so inexpensive land number two there um there's a real estate boom in certain areas for example north of dallas between dallas and the oklahoma border there's a flat out boom going on and the housing developments are, are going up ahead of the utilities, way ahead of them. And so I, I'm, I'm building a housing development. Where's the sewage? Nowhere near. You know, it's 10 miles away and, and that ridiculously high cost. So we go ahead and we put in the pods. And this is company number two, which company number one does these giant custom systems. Fine. Custom, company number two does these modular pods that drop in place. All you got to do is set up a pad with water and, and electricity, and the semi comes along and drops it in place, and boom, you got water treatment. And so we've accelerated the, um, the water treatment side for these operate these uh, developers that are not necessarily um, close to um, sewage. Now, for residential that have easy access to sewage, it's not. I I, I would say connect connect to sewage and. You're done. Why? Because human um, effluent is really easy for the city to treat. Mm -hmm. It's 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 very clean relative compared to dioxane or whatever, or forever pla forever chemicals, all the stuff that the that the industrials put out. Um, human human waste is pretty benign, and so um, you only have a problem when you outstrip, um, you know, when you go into areas that are poorly. Um, um, you know, structured for sewage. And mm -hmm. that's where it really it starts to shine and work well for us. Now, trailer parks are a special case because they rarely are permitted to connect to sewage. They kind of have to do their own thing. The city, I know, I know, the city doesn't want to know. Like, no, 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 you were on your own before, you're still on your own. Um, so, you know, mobile home parks and RV campgrounds are natively do their own water treatment. That's kind of how it's been. Uh, highway rest stops are another category. So there's some very uh, specialized categories. But in the multifamily space, it works um, if you have, um, you know, you're, you're sewer distant, basically. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. Now, this might be a dumb question, but, you know, that's okay. I don't mind asking it uh, for the sake of people getting to understand things better. Um, now, when we're talking about this water, is this water that people will actually drink? Or is this all for, you know, other purposes, you know, such as, you know, watering the grass or however people want to use it? Because I assume that there's got to be an element of liability that would come into play as well if you're putting in this type of in infrastructure and you're doing these types of things on your property for the consumption of the water. So is it to be consumed or not? Yeah, well, it's uh, liability is one aspect, but also cost. In other words, it's relatively cheap to create water that's suitable for irrigation, but then it gets much more expensive to get it to potable. Exactly. So typically, for example, a brewery can reuse 50% of its water without using the water to make beer. 
hmm. just to do washdowns and steam vessels and that kind of stuff. And so that's what we see them do is the non-drinkable aspect, but they get multiple turns out of the water. And it's, and by the way, America was, had its water systems built on the throw it away basis, right? Um, no deposit, no return. The water just goes away. And as a result, uh, we have recycle rates of less than 1% in this country. Whereas uh, other countries like um, Israel has a, almost a 90% recycle rate. Uh, Las Vegas does really well. But in general, the US is does a very poor job. But if I'm treating the water, then I can inherently recycle it. So that's a really good thing. Now, one thing we are really strongly advocates for is we're not going to try and privatize the fresh water, incoming fresh water. It's been a disaster, whatever it's been done. We, we believe the government does the best job of stewarding the, the clean water supply. Unless you dig your own well, use the city water. Mm -hmm. But that's just a simple water pipe. That's not a sewage line. Right. That's very different. Right. Um, interesting. There's, you know, obviously this is way out of my wheelhouse. It's the first time I've started to really think about all the complexities associated with water. It's really interesting. Um, so now let's talk about your water stable coins. Now, what is this concept about and, and where does it fit into the business model? Okay. Well, at the moment, due to the SEC not being in love with crypto, it's no part of our current business model, but it is a future one. And I'll tell you why. Let's go back to this concept of water like an oil well with the basket of assets and people invest and they get a profit share. And currently that's where, you know, your audience can go to originclear.com, click on invest now, and they'll hear all about it. Uh, you know, the equity side and so forth. And the unit we created, Water On Demand, is on its way to the NASDAQ. Origin Clear is remaining a penny stock. We probably won't have time to talk very much about that, but Water On Demand now is being um, acquired by a blank check company that puts it on the NASDAQ. Mm, but, exciting. so, great. And it's it's going to improve, as I, as I was saying earlier, you, you need to be on the NASDAQ to raise proper capital. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. So that's happening right now. And so investors in this um, water like an oil well concept called water on demand, they get 25% of the profits from this basket of properties, but they also get shares in Origin Clear and shares in water on demand. So it's a really good um, basic investment in this breakthrough category called decentralized water. All right. Now, you may, now you've got a contract for the life of the fund to receive uh, profit share. Mm -hmm. And the way we do it now, of course, we pay the dividends as we always do with ACH. Fine. Mm -hmm. It works okay. Um, it's a pain because then somebody changes banks and then it breaks and, you know, all that stuff. But it's it's been, you know, kind of, it works acceptably. But um, what we said is, well, why, why not package the contract itself in um, a digital wrapper, a digital bond, shall we say. And so we created something called dollar H2O, which is uh, when you sign the contract to be the, to receive these profits, you receive, if you uh, optionally don't, it's not required, but in the future you would receive the, the option to take it in the form of a, of a um, crypto. And that allows you, of course, the payments just happen automatically. And if you want to transfer um, either the payments or your entire contract to someone else, it's a very simple matter. Hmm. Now, the reason it's important, I mean, it's, that's nice. It's, a, it's an incremental benefit. It's kind of a better convenience. But here's where it starts to matter. Water is not a commodity today. It's, a, it's something that's valuable but it's not a commodity, meaning that it's not something that is bought and sold on markets. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and for the, the good reason is that it's not very portable. It's very hard to um, transport water economically. It's too cheap. And so if I have a, a water risk in Northern California, I can't offset that risk with Singapore water. There's no market to do it. But now imagine that we've created water on demand here in, in North America, and then we've um, cloned it 
to other financial centers because it's a fintech and it does not rely on building the water companies. It just funds those. So it takes advantage of the existing network of water companies in Middle East, uh, India, Japan, et cetera. So we, we, we clone the fin financial system. Well, now every gallon of water going through that system has a payment attached to it. So it's mm -hmm. monetized by this water as a service. And so in the future, we believe we'd be creating a water market and by far the easiest way to create a market of anything is to create um, a cryptocurrency because it naturally, um, there's no um, national boundaries, for example. You don't have to worry about, you know, conversion of funds or anything like that. It's simply, um, you know, it's a nice long address that you better not forget. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and the seed phrases and all that crazy okay. stuff. Um, but the point is, is that it, it, down the road, once we've we've um, sort of uh, multiplied the, the the water on demand concept through licensing, we're going to end up with a lot of um, users all over the world who are getting water as a service on the same model, and therefore you'd be able to do uh, trading and options and so forth. That's way far away, away but very that's kind of, very interesting, very innovative. Wow. Very cool. All right. Well, we have one more thing that I wanted to touch on, but before we do, uh, let's hear a word from our sponsor. Ready to Scale is brought to you by Blue Lake Capital, where we hunt down the best multifamily investment opportunities that we can find and invite investors to join in with us. We target Class B value-add multifamily properties across the Sun Belt. Our CEO, Ellie Perlman, invests a substantial amount of capital into every deal. This means our interests are aligned with yours. If you're an accredited investor looking to expand your portfolio and diversify sponsors, be sure to visit us at bluelake-capital.com. Blue Lake Capital. Be bold, be extraordinary, and keep moving forward. Okay, so Riggs, I'd actually like to pivot a little bit and talk about leadership and building teams, because clearly you haven't gotten this far on your own, and um, you're not going to get where you're trying to go right on your own either. So I saw that you had posted something on LinkedIn about break to build, yes. and um, and so it definitely caught my attention. What is the concept of break to build when it comes to leading a team? Well, first of all, break to build is a concept that um, I, I stole from an old Air Jordan commercial, <laughs> and um, it's a, it's a wonderful way to you know when you're building a sports team, you want all these disparate people come in. You got to break to build. You got to to create a team. You got to break their individuality and turn them into a team. And I first saw it. I was doing competitive rowing, and I saw it on a team's T-shirts where the coach was going to do exactly that. Okay. So fast forward, it became kind of my mantra of in order to uh, really disrupt markets, you got to break to build. You got to break the existing thing and build. That's great. And so I've I've kind of, um, you know, I start, started a Substack, which deals with that. And it, what um, is interesting about this is that there's an additional layer, break to build with a team. Because the thing that I realized a couple of years ago was that I had not been enough of a team builder in my career. I'd been, a, I'd been a, a hero a lot. I'm trying to make this happen. I'm trying to make that happen. Why won't you people pitch in? And finally I realized, you know what? I need to get a team of equals around me. It's not Superman, it's League of Avengers, right? Mm -hmm. So that was like, oh, duh. And <laughs> um, it helped that, in fact, my own business started really clicking when I started uh, attracting um, people who were easily at my level and sometimes I think better in their own category um, for things like, uh, you know, investor management and marketing and so forth. And of course, running these water companies. And so I have become really, really, really focused on the need to be a, a a training officer, a trainer, a coach to um, work on how to get, you know, just like, you know, eight people on a rowing a, a shell, as they call it. Once they all are rowing in sync, the job becomes much easier. I've felt it. 
Jeanette, is the most amazing feeling to be in a boat and you're working, working, working. And all of a sudden, everybody's clicking and you're flying mm -hmm. with the same amount of effort. You're going much, much faster. And that's the key here is to operate as a team, it dramatically reduces the effort required to get from A to B and you can scale. This is your podcast is about scaling. Well, you can't scale. Uh, you got to scale with obviously systems, no question about it. You got to have good systems and you got to build on them and you got to understand when things are not working and not working. You got to have good strategic direction, et cetera. But you also have to have a, a team building capability. And without that, I'm afraid that you're screwed because it'll never go beyond you. And we all become bottlenecks eventually, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. Interesting. Okay. Well, um, thank you for sharing that. I, I actually, uh, it's encouraging to me and how I lead my team and then where I fit into the picture with the rest of the team. And um, it, it's, it's fun and it's uh, always challenging and it is very fulfilling too. I think when you take time to be mindful of the impact you're having on your team and, and their development. Um, well, last but not least, Riggs, before I let you go, at the end of each show, we always do what's called the lightning round questions. Sure. So these are five questions I ask all of our guests. So just to keep it a little bit fun and extra interesting. So my first question for you is, what do you actually do for fun? I am an avid skier. <laughs> I ski, I'm crazy about it. My wife has a small school here in Clearwater and, um, uh, I make it my duty to take them on school ski trips. Uh, <laughs> and this year I trained them enough that we, we went, it was up in Montana. We got up in the mountain and I said, okay, kids, let's go. And they all poof, disappeared. They'd gotten good enough to go bye-bye. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of footage of me going down the mountain all by myself, but um, I've loved it for years. And, um, and it's kind of, I, I wait all summer for the snow to fall again. Interesting. Interesting. Okay, cool. All right. Now, what is something um, interesting about you that most people don't know? That's well, I think what's most interesting about me that people don't know is that I'm helping to build a revolutionary school here in Clearwater. Um, mm -hmm. My wife, um, Sigrid Burkett Eckleberry is an amazing educator. Um, and you can go to Facebook slash every kid's a genius to know more. But um I am privileged to be helping her really um, transform the lives of of children and young adults. And, and th there's nothing more important, in my opinion. I, it, everything that I do is nothing compared to creating the next generation, right? So that's something I'm proud of that people generally don't know about me. Very interesting. Okay. I'm, I'm very curious. I'll have to go and check it out now. All right. Um, now, what about as far as a book? You know, um, we have a lot of, you know, obviously very smart people that, you know, are listening honestly to our show. Um, most of them, you know, are accredited investors, have done pretty well in their lives. But what book would you recommend they need to make sure they've included in their library? Well, um, I'm a big follower of Al Reese, uh, who invented the concept of positioning back in the day. Um, but he wrote this book, The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. Mm -hmm. It's very approachable, very readable. Um, this is where I I was, um, you know, he brings up this concept of be first in category. And if you can't be first in a category, invent a category in which you can be first. Even if you're operating um, at a local or regional level, you got to figure out how to be number one in whatever, you know, and and like, you know, you're, let's say you're a realtor, will we'll be the realtor that deals with a certain kind of audience and with a certain kind of panache, a certain kind of way so that you are unique. Mm -hmm. And I, that's the kind of thing that I think is every, um, every person who's in business should read the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. Excellent. Okay. All right. Now, um, I, I'm, I might be able to guess what you would say to this, but I'll let you speak for yourself. One of the things that we also talk about on the show is, you know, yes, we all want to make money. We want to see strong returns, but there's so much more behind why we want to make money. And it's about really building and living extraordinary lives. Sure. So what is your advice to someone that has the goal of living an extraordinary life? Well, that's a really, really good question. I think that um, you you need to look at the quality of what you're doing. In other words, 
you know, you're going to make money. It, I take it for granted you're going to figure out how to make money because otherwise you're not going to put food on the table. But for example, I'll give you an example. You know, we live in a, in a condo development that is truly amazing. We, we bought it um, in 2021 and um, it's, it's astonishingly beautiful. Um, and, you know, um, I give your viewers kind of a look at what it looks like. That's what the front of it looks like. Very nice. And, um, the developers who are personal friends of ours, they put their heart in it. It is, it is so beyond what they had to do to make money. So I think you need to think about go well beyond, you know, ordinary exchange into uh, going above and beyond into ultra amazing exchange. Like let's make this thing. And, and we love living here, everything about it. And the, the, People here are so helpful and, and the developers were careful to choose people who were nice people. I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> so that's really just, you know, think about how you can go above and beyond because I, I, I think that's how we make a better world is by going above and beyond in the, even the smallest things we do. Great advice. Love it. All right. And then last but not least, uh, if people want to get in touch with you, where can they find you? Well, the most, uh, the thing I recommend is that I do a, weekly briefing on Zoom every Thursday night. Uh, there'll be one in a couple hours. Um, and we're up to, I think, number 260. We started January 17th, uh, um, 2020, right? Just when things were starting to be interesting. <laughs> and um, it's been, it was it was on teleconference before that. Then we, we went to Zoom starting in January 2020 because we were aware of what was happening with the world. Um, and it's a way for people to um, hear from us. We, we have the execs on board. It's very casual, very uh, um, fun kind of thing. And, and, you know, people learn a lot about what we do, but we also talk about a lot of, a lot of interesting topics. So go to originclear.com. There's a pop-up, sign up for the CEO briefing, and you'll be able to comment there and we address your comments. Um, also, any one of the emails that comes from me, if you hit reply, it comes to my inbox. And I'd love to hear from people. So sign up. And um, of course, uh, okay, I'm I'm not going to pretend that I handle the LinkedIn stuff very well. <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, really? So. Uh, well, so, you're doing a good job. <laughs> well, I, could, I just say when people go into my inbox, I'm sorry, you're not going to necessarily hear from me, but go ahead and sign up uh, for the briefings. You'll also get on my list reply to my emails. I'd love to hear from you. And, um, you know, I do believe that um, people in real estate should look at um, other other asset categories. And, you know, people in real estate are like, well, I don't know. I know that space really well. And they're right. But take some amount of money and put it into a different asset. And we think that, obviously, we think that the the new asset class that is being created out of the um, decentralization, the privatization of water, is super interesting and uh, take a look, go to originclear.com, check it out. Yeah, I think it's interesting too. And and we do encourage investors to uh, be diversified. Um, you know, no, the, at least I would say, you know, real estate has definitely been proven to make people very wealthy, but it's certainly not the only component of most people's portfolios. Uh, so, you know, very interesting to me and I'm sure it was interesting to our listeners today. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. It's such a pleasure, Jeanette, and thank you for the cool questions. I appreciate it. <laughs> I tried. I tried. You're well, it was a, it was a well. brave new world for me, water. <laughs> for those of you that tuned in today, thank you for investing your time with us. I really appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments, don't forget to like, rate, subscribe, leave us some stuff in, uh, in the comment section or on iTunes. Uh, we definitely do read them and appreciate them. In the meantime, be bold, be strong, and keep moving forward.